trying to figure out somebody's got an issue. Mike's gone. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah, he's right. All right, so we have a bunch of people on, so I think we should get started. What do you think? <clears throat> I'm ready. ready. Okay. All right, so I'm going to I'm just going to read a little bit here um, for any of our viewers that had a chance to see Jean Becker um, in her special visit at the University of New England in early October. You got to hear about some of the special relationships that she has made with locals, um, employees around town and fans of the Bush family over several decades. We are so grateful that she has agreed to continue her conversation with us here tonight at Graves Library. And really, Jean, we apologize that we could not do this in person. We really hoped to do that for you, but hopefully we'll maybe invite you back in 2022. So- For her next book. For, yeah. Oh, so for the for next those, book, uh-huh. <laughs> so for those of you attending at home, get your glass ready because we are gonna toast to Jean Becker, hopefully you have a, a glass of sparkling rosé with you. And we are toasting to her career, to her new book that has come out. And um, we are gonna hear a lot more about that um, with Val um, having lots of questions, lots of really good questions. So um, just wanna say a big thanks to Michael Davis for helping us with the computer issues. And if anybody does want a copy of the book, um, we do have some, and we will be, um, Jean's going to sign those, and if you just want to send me a quick note or give me a call and let me know how you want it personalized. So um, I have the special pleasure of introducing our interviewer today. So this is Val Marrier. Hello, Val. Hello. So, and uh, who better to conduct this hour of fun than Val Marrier? <laughs> if you don't know her, she's a freelance journalist who lives in Wells. She graduated from Skidmore College and is content and happy in her life. <laughs> she's a wife, a mother, a grandmother who enjoys knitting, golfing, traveling, and reading. And besides writing for the tourists in town, her blog, Wanderings with Val, is definitely something that you want to sign up for. It is one of the best things to read through and have fun with. So thank you, Val, for doing this for thank us. You. Thank you. I'm going to skip out for just a minute. So okay. you start. You start. A little closer here. Welcome, Jean. Thank you. Well, it's very nice to be here. And welcome, everyone, to the happy hour at the Graves Library here in Kennebunkport, Maine. Uh, we're so lucky to have Jean Becker, who lived here for 25 years, 25 summers, Five because summers. She, was, she, she was chief of staff to President George Herbert Walker Bush in his post-presidential years. A little background on Jean. She grew up in Missouri, was valedictorian of her high school class, graduated from the University of Missouri with two degrees, one in political science and one in journalism after which she went to work for USA Today and ended up on the election team of 1988, which was the Bush Dukakis campaign. And after George Bush was victorious, I'm convinced someone in the Bush family must have noticed Jean's work because she was immediately asked to be deputy press secretary to Barbara Bush, where she, where she was, at, those were her White House years. After his loss in 1992, the Bush family moved back to Houston and Jean went with them to help uh, Mrs. Bush write her memoirs, do editing and research. And by chance when she was there, George Bush's then chief of staff um, quit. And he turned to Jean and he said, would you be my chief of, acting chief of staff? Well, that act, 
acting. He, he asked me to keep the seat warm. He asked me if I would keep the seat warm until he figured out who his new chief of staff should be. She warmed that seat for 25 years, <laughs> during which time she met everyone from Vladimir Putin to the Oak Ridge Boys. She truly was in the room where it happened. One night, there was a dinner of former presidents, former living presidents, and dignitaries from afar honoring George Bush. And Jean noticed that the salad was about to be served. Everyone was seated except for President Clinton, who was chatting away and chatting away as he was known to do. Well, Jean walked right over to him, tapped him on the shoulder and said, Mr. President, I love you, but would you kindly sit down and stop talking? Which he did and gave her a hug. It's stories like that that fill this book that Jean wrote from her notes, journals, memoirs, um, photos. The Man I Knew, The Amazing Story of George H.W. Bush's Post-Presidency. Jean, can you tell us how, when, where, why this book came about? Okay, first of all, Val, I, I have to say, I'm so excited to be here. I wish we were together in Kennebunkport, but since it's happy hour, and since it's a virtual event, which I think that means everybody's watching from home, sometimes when I do events this time of night, I think it's sort of fun to play a drinking game. So every time you or I say the word Kennebunkport, everybody needs to take a sip of their beverage, starting right now. So we'll practice. I wish I were in Kennebunkport right now. Oh, okay, cheers. <laughs> Okay, your question. Um, you know, I wasn't sure I should write this book. Um, I got a call out of the blue from the man who eventually would be my editor, a wonderful man named Sean Desmond, who, who is editor, head of the publishing company 12, which is the division of his chat, which is the division of something else. Anyway, he, we have several, he has several authors who are friends of mine but the number one author is Dana Perino, who the wonderful Dana Perino, Dana, he is Dana's editor. And Dana said to him, you need to call Jean Becker and tell her if she ever writes a book, you would like to edit it. So he called me about a year before President Bush died and I was sort of appalled. And I said, write a book. I said, I'm not gonna write a book. Why are you calling me? Who are you? I'm not gonna write a book. Um, and then after President Bush died, and I began to think about just the amazing man he was and all the great stories I knew that would illustrate what an amazing life he had led and what an amazing person he was, I decided to be criminal not to write a book. How did you come up with the title, Jean? Oh, I so wish that I could take credit for the title um, Sean, my editor, Sean, came up with the title, and it was this conversation. I sent him, I think, the first 100 pages to make sure I was on the right track, and I was getting ready. I was going to interview President Clinton, all five of the Bush kids, the grandkids, probably a number of people right there in Kennebunkport. Oops, wait. Um, and I sent him 100 pages. And he emailed me, but he called me. Actually, I saw him in New York. This was right before the pandemic broke out. I saw him in New York and he was looking at the 100 pages and he said, you know what, Jean? I don't want you to interview anybody for this book. I want this to be your story. I want this to be, you actually used the phrasing, Val, before we came on the air, pull back the curtain. And he said, I want you to pull back the curtain of the life of a former president he says, I want you to write about the man you knew. Write about the man you knew. I don't want to know what Bill Clinton or James Baker or even any of his kids thought. And we sort of looked at each other and we knew that was the name of the book. And, you know, it has saved my life because there have been times in interviews, here it is, when reporters have tried to drag me into current events or to talk about things that happened before I was chief of staff, like what about when he said this in the 1988 campaign? And I just stop them and say, this book is about the man I knew. So you're gonna have to, you know, your questions have gotta be relevant to the man I knew. 
So I love the title and I owe it to my editor. I like the title too. And you did know him. How, I keep thinking of the timing. You met him in March of, if I'm correct, 2020, your editor? He, well, I did a book. Oh, the beginning I, met, of I, met him a year, I met him a year earlier. I did a little book uh, about Mrs. Bush. It was all about all the advice she gave out in her lifetime. Wait, wait one minute. Here it is. <laughs> I wrote uh, Pearls of Wisdom, and I actually was doing this book for Simon & Schuster, and I've never really talked about this publicly, but I was doing this book for Simon & Schuster, the Bush's longtime uh, publishing company. Their wonderful editor, Lisa Drew, had retired. I had a huge artistic disagreement with the new editor, huge. I mean, I, and we, I had never signed a contract. So remembering the conversation from Sean Desmond, I sent him an email and I said, would you be interested in this book? It's all about all of the advice she gave out. And he, and he said, yes. He says, send me a book proposal and I'll take a look at it. And I emailed him back and I said, I've written the book. <laughs> the whole the book is done. I'm going to send you the whole book. Anyway, he came to the rescue. They published this book. Um, and I was in New York. The first week of March of 2020, everybody think about what happened that month to kick off the press and the publicity for Pearls of Wisdom. And I did like three or four TV interviews, and then the whole thing got shut down by COVID. And that's it's that while I was in New York, when Sean and I talked about the man I knew, and he, I went back to Houston and I wrote for nine months and I turned the book in at noon on Christmas Eve. Wow. What a That's what I did during the pandemic. That's wonderful. Um, as chief of staff, moving into your actual job, can you describe a typical day, if there is such a typical day with a man like George Herbert Walker Bush? No, <laughs> there was not a typical day. I, I say in the book that being his chief of staff was like riding a roller coaster. It was wild. And my two favorite examples of just how diverse my life was, I talk about that Mikhail Gorbachev once told me to shut up, but I was once kissed by Tom Selleck. So I just never knew what the day would, would bring. I got to, he was an early bird. He was a more early morning person. I got to the office between 6.30 and seven. I was always relieved when I beat him there. He never was later than 7.30. Bless you. Bless you. you, Val. Thank you. And I usually went home about seven, uh, typically worked 12 hour days. And it was, he was, there's an entire chapter in the book called I Have an Idea. And they were the four scariest words that George Bush would say to me. Five scariest words. Gene, I have an idea. And I knew then, Val, I needed to hold on tight. <laughs> Did you have to put out any major fires, douse on any fires that came on? No, I, uh, I get asked that question once in a while and I've tried to come up with some really unique, creative story that would really surprise everybody. I mean, we, I put out a hundred brush fires, a hundred brush fires. By far, the hardest thing I did was his funeral. And, and I think we're going to talk about that later. Like, yes. but I will tell you that the biggest fire I had to put out at his funeral, this was for the service at the National Cathedral. And the National Cathedral, which was the state funeral, I think it holds 1,800 people. And I got literally 800 of those 1,800 seats to fill. Because it's a state funeral, all of Congress is invited and their spouses, all the Supreme Court is invited, the diplomatic court is invited, all the all 51 governors and their spouses are invited. And a and hundred tickets traditionally go to the White House for the incumbent president and senior staff. So the Bush family alone took up about half of those 800 seats. So the biggest fire I had to put out was the day before the funeral of the cathedral. I had been warned by the secret by the chief of staffs, uh, President Reagan and President Ford, that a lot of Congress would not come. 
It all depended if they were in session, how busy they were, what was going on. But they said, the problem is those seats won't come back to you until about five o'clock the night before the funeral. Well, sure enough, at five o'clock before the 10 o'clock service the next morning, I got 500 seats back from Congress alone. And that was a while, I was ready, I had a plan. I, I'd over invited by 300 people. My staff was so nervous. Well, I'd over invited by more than that, but we had 280 RSVPs from people that we could not seat. But then when I got the 500 seats back, we could. Anyway, yeah. I had a plan, but that was a nerve wracking day. And the other part of this, and a lot of this has to do with just how beloved President Bush was, we thought we had done a really good job inviting people who should have needed to be invited. The phones were ringing off the hook with people saying, I would really appreciate to be invited. And I did not put this in the book, but I will just tell the people in Kennebunkport, two of those people were Al Gore and John Kerry. And I actually emailed, they both, we, we found seats for both of them. They both said it just would mean a lot to them to be able to come to the service. I emailed George W. Bush and I said, I have a new category of seating for your father's funeral, men who you ran against for president. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that, was, that was a tough day. That was a long, tough day. And, and I was sort of getting it from all sides. So I would say seating the National Cathedral was the biggest fire I had to deal with. Um, were you always at his beck and call? There was a, <laughs> there was a story of, that you wrote in the book about, um, he called one night at two o'clock in the morning and he said, Jane, I'm at Walgreens with, uh, Brian Mulroney, the former prime minister of Canada. And he's got the sniffles and we don't know what to do. So Jane, what should we do? And you told president Bush, get some NyQuil. And he goes, Jane <laughs> says you should buy NyQuil, Brian, get the NyQuil. Did you ever think of going part-time? <laughs> you know, that I, I put that, I put, well, the reason you know that story is because I put it in the book. It was just so random. I was at his beck and call and, uh, you know, what a great honor to be at his beck and call. But it, he did call me a lot. I did toward, in the last couple of years when he had slowed down quite a bit, I was interested in exploring going part-time. And there were some other things I wanted to do. I wanted to go back to writing, not necessarily this book. I already had pearls of wisdom in the back of my head. And I, I just wanted to spend more time writing. And I was just thinking, I mean, I had been working 80 hour weeks for 25 years. And so I was thinking about going part-time. So I talked to him about it and he was very supportive and understood completely. And at the end of the conversation, he said, will I be allowed to call you on the days that you're not at the office. And you know what? That was it. I, I abandoned the whole idea. It was, you know what? It was sweet and dear. And I said, you know, I, I don't want to go part-time. Never mind. He said, oh, okay. Uh, in your book, you also describe it was like opening a Christmas present every day working for the Bushes. You have had great affection and admiration and respect for the whole family and especially George and Barbara. Um, but there were days, uh, might this be a good time for you to tell us about your complete nervous breakdown? Oh my gosh. Um, uh, I think I was on the verge of several. I remember one time, this was after in 1997, President Bush, oh my gosh, that was such a big year. His library opened that year as presidential library at Texas A&M. It's the first time he jumped out of an airplane we had the first huge event about his presidency happened at some university on Long Island. It was just one huge event after another. And I have to laugh for Christmas that year, President Bush gave me a cruise, a Caribbean cruise as my Christmas gift. It's the nicest gift he ever gave me. And he said, I'm thinking maybe you need to take a little time off and take a cruise. So I think I was perhaps on the verge all of 1997. But I, as I write in the book, believe it or not, and the people in Kennebunkport, cheers, um, <laughs> you all might find this surprising, but 
but the toughest months could be kind of bunk board. Um, the main reason being, there are two big reasons for that. One is the staff was split in half. Half the staff stayed in Houston. The only staff that came to Kennebunkport was myself and whoever the Bush's aides were, Mrs. Bush's aide and President Bush's aide. So there was only three of us on the front lines. And as I reminded the Houston staff, the people who stayed back in Houston, and you know, I, they hated it because they got sort of bored. It was a hundred degrees. And whenever they were sort of whiny about being in Houston, I said, just keep in mind that the tornado came to Maine with us. That would be George Herbert Walker Bush. The other problem in Kennebunkport was the family who I love and still love, that they descended upon Walker's Point and our life was just chaos. So I think the best way to illustrate that is I'm going to read two memos, two sharp memos. I tried to keep the Houston staff, the people back in Houston in the loop of what was going on. So I'm gonna read two short memos. This was written on August 20th, 1996. And the subject line is Walker's Point House Guests. At last count, we had sailed past 100 people. Seriously. Among the luminaries had been Clarence Thomas, Lech Valenza, Freddie Couples, Billy Graham, and Richard North Patterson. I then footnoted that and said, a Supreme Court justice, a foolish head of state, a golfer, a man of God, and an author. We've had one cat, one rabbit, and several dogs. It was not a smart move on the part of anyone who brought these animals to do so. The numbers will continue to skyrocket next week with the arrival of the Oak Ridge boys and their wives. I mean, that memo just shows you, Val, it was just chaos at Walker's Point. Now, this, this is the memo you're referring to. The subject line is complete nervous breakdown. July 30th, 1997, 2.43 p.m. We have grand, and again, this is to the staff back in Houston. We have grandkids eating things off trees. That's true. They were eating some wild berry off the trees and we had to take them to the emergency room. The local barber, Emil Roy, sort of a Roy Orbison lookalike, wants to go out with me. I am not interested. Paula Rendon, the housekeeper, is lost somewhere between here and Houston because her flight was canceled. The stupid ass restaurant where the Bushes are having dinner tonight has now called four times to make sure, quote, they have it right. John Carlo, that would be President Bush's aide at the time, wrecked one of President Bush's boats on the rocks. They shut the water off. President Bush's fishing buddy wants to go out with Quincy, that would be Mrs. Bush's aide, and she doesn't want to. Some tourists took my picture when I went to lunch. They think I'm important. I'm sick of the Chinese and hope they lose Hong Kong, Taiwan, Tibet, and Mongolia. Do they even have Mongolia? Now, I will tell you that I footnoted this I said, my guess is a Chinese delegation wanted to come see President Bush, which was quite often, not to offend a, a country of one billion people, but they were always higher maintenance than most. I do just want to apologize to any Chinese who might be watching. <laughs> now back to the memo. But they were high maintenance. Quincy and I want cheese enchiladas, and there are none for 800 miles. We are still getting dead dog mail. Mrs. Bush's dog, Millie, had died earlier in the summer, and we were just, she was getting flooded with sympathy notes and cards. We got a letter written in German, and we don't know any. And because it's a gorgeous day, we're running away. In fact, we're probably already gone. Don't call, don't write, send help, or send money. We'll come back tomorrow, maybe. Oh, Jean. <laughs> you know, I just, I wrote that on a day where I had just, had it. I mean, everything from the water being shut off to grandkids eating things off the trees to getting the German ladder. We're just like, oh my God, what else is going to happen? Well, you also had a front row seat to a wonderful love affair of George and Barbara Bush. And this, there's this picture here. We're trying to filter in some pictures. Uh, I, I think this picture tells so much about the uh, the first couple, their love that it just went on and on. Could you talk a little bit about um, what you observed and did you ever have to play Henry Kissinger? Uh, 
where they're they're both very strong-willed people. You mean be the diplomat? The be the diplomat. <laughs> Uh, you know, let me just, yeah, it, theirs was a great love story. They were married uh, 73 years, and their granddaughter, uh, Ellie LeBlanc Sosa, wrote a wonderful book about her grandparents' love story, and I would encourage everyone to read it. Her co-author is actually someone there in Maine, and I should know her name, and of course, I'm old, and I'm drawing a blank, but uh, it's a wonderful book about their love story, but they just... They adored each other right up until the end. And I, this is such a silly story to tell you. There's some really touching stories right at the end of their life, but I'm gonna encourage everyone to read the book for them. I will never forget one day, they had been married well over 50 years by this time. And I was sitting in the Bush's bedroom. We're in Kennebunk Court. And I'm sitting in the Bush's bedroom, visiting with her about some things. And she can hear him come into the house. She hears his voice because he, I'm sure he yelled out, hey, bar. She immediately got up and went to a mirror and did this. It just touched my heart that she wanted her cheeks to be a little rosy and she started fixing her hair. And he, of course, he came in looking like a homeless person. I think he'd been out on the boat fishing. But, you know, he was the love of her life. And, and she was the love of his life. Oh, and again, there's a wonderful story about the last time, about less than a week before she died. But I'm just going to challenge everyone to read the book. However, did they disagree? The answer would be yes. And uh, I watched President Bush was actually quite masterful in how he argued with his wife. He had this, this is why I think he was a good president. He had this way of arguing with her that by the end of the argument, she decided the thing they were arguing about, like if he wanted to do something and she didn't want to do it, by the end of the argument, he would have convinced her it was her idea to do it in the first place. I saw him do this more than once. But one of the funniest scenes on his 90th birthday, he is going to parachute at St. Anne's there in Kenanbuck Board. And I all of us thought it was crazy. I, he was already in a wheelchair. I actually called his oldest son about a month before his birthday to say, do you, I need you to know what's going on here. Your dad wants a parachute on his 90th birthday. And George W. said to me, he says, well, what is your concern, Gene? And I said, well, that he'll die. That he'll, he'll he, you know, that the parachute will be a disaster and he'll die. And he said, Gene, let dad do what he wants to do. He said, if that's what he wants to do on his 90th birthday, let him do it. And if it doesn't work, what a great way to go out. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. So everybody, you know what? And he, I really, he was right. He absolutely was right. And so we arranged for him, the, his, the former Golden Knights, the army parachute team came to Maine. They're the ones who always jumped with him and we trusted them. But it was really not a nice day, a very low ceiling, a very low ceiling. Um, we weren't sure, we thought we were gonna have to cancel the jump. And so it's the afternoon before and President Bush makes a decision with the Golden Knight that he's going to jump with, with the Golden Knight team that he is going to jump. And they send me to the house to tell her that the jump <laughs> is on. So I walk up to the house. I walk up to the big house at Walker's Point. She's in her bedroom needle pointing. And I said, and once the conversation was over, I was supposed to text President Bush's aide. And then he was going to swoop in along with Mike Elliott, the Golden Knight, who was going to jump with him and, you know, be all sweetness and light. But I'm the one who had to break the news. So I tell her, she's furious. She just starts needle pointing even faster. And she said, you know, if that's what he wants to do, whatever. Tell him, go right ahead. I may or may not come. She did come. I may or may not come, but whatever, fine, just fine. And she looks out the window. I text and I said, okay, you can come to the house now. And she looks out the window and she sees President Bush 
and his aide, Jimmy, pushing his wheelchair and a couple of the Golden Knights. And she looked at me and she said, but I don't want to talk to them. You go out there and you tell those men to go away. I don't want to talk to them. Well, I went outside and I said, okay, she's on board. She may or may not come. She has no interest in talking to any of you right now. And they're like, oh, okay. And then, and of course it all turned out okay. He lived to tell about it and she was there when he landed and gave him a big hug and a kiss. And it the was rest quite of an it. event. It was quite an event here in town. You know, yeah. you touched briefly on um, the relationship of father son. There's a wonderful picture here of the two of them in the National Cathedral. I believe it's in the Na National Cathedral. Could you discuss um, their relationship? You know, two presidents. Did he feel a tinge of envy perhaps when 43 became president and 41 was not, you know, was done after his tough loss? Never, never envy, never envy. He was so proud. He was proud of both George W. and Jeb. In fact, I, I say in the book, 1993 was a tough year the year after he lost the election. And, and I would say that George and Jeb running for governors of their respective states, Texas and Florida in 1994, is one of the main reasons why President Bush completely snapped out of his post-1992 malaise. And oh my gosh, he was so proud when, when then Governor Bush was elected President of the United States in 2000. So there was never any envy. It did mean they had to, his life changed a little bit. Um, and mainly in that President Bush was never big on giving a lot of interviews. He was not on social media at all. He pretty well held his own counsel all through President Clinton's presidency. But there were a number of interview opportunities that came along that we declined because President Bush knew that any time he said anything publicly, the media would overanalyze it. And how did it compare to what 43 said? And I remember specifically, this was a big problem on 9-11, Val, where President Ford, President Clinton, um, President Carter, they had all made statements on 9-11 and had given interviews and President Bush didn't. He didn't for about a week because he knew he needed to stay out of his son's way. Mm -hmm. um, so that, was, that would be the only small hiccup. And then of course, there was the mass confusion about their names for, you know, two George Bushes was very complicated in, in many ways. In fact, the day George W. was sworn in, President Bush tells the story, he was taking a hot, hot bath after a very cold inauguration and inaugural parade. And one of the White House butlers, he and Mrs. Bush are of course staying at the White House. And one of the White House butlers came and knocked on the door and said, your son would like to see you in the Oval Office. And as you can imagine, that was a source of just unbelievable pride. So okay. he hurried up and got dressed and ran down to the Oval Office. And then brand new President of the United States is there with his White House Chief of Staff, Andy Card. And at one point, Andy Card said, Mr. President, and 41 turned around and said, yes, Andy. And then he realized, oh, oh, whoa, wait, no, he's not talking to me, he's talking to the president. So it was former Congressman John Dingell who came up with the idea at the annual Alfalfa Club dinner, a big deal in Washington, DC. He says, I have come up with a solution to the two George Bushes. The first George Bush, George H.W. Bush was the 41st president of the United States. And George W. Bush is the 43rd. So we started calling them 41 and 43, and it was truly a lifesaver. Oh, it's very, very affectionately done. I, and I will tell you one quick story. This, of course, took place in Kennebunkport. I know everybody wants to take a sip of their bubbly. Um, I'm going to not, so I can just tell the story while the West rest of you imbibe. It was the very first time George and Laura came to visit. It would have been August of, of uh, 2001. They were in Maine, they were visiting uh, pr the president's parents and George W. had gone out for a really early run 
and he came into his parents' bedroom. Their bedroom was a big gathering place at Walker's Point. All the kids and grandkids would come in early in the morning and have coffee and they would read the paper. And George W., I guess, was dripping with sweat. And he, he sits on the couch and puts his feet up on his mother's coffee table. And she gave him the devil. And she said, take your feet off my table. And President Bush said, 41 said, Barbara, he's the president of the United States of America. You can't talk like that to him. To which she said, he's also my son. He was my son first. Take your feet off. <laughs> and I'm told that he did. <laughs> That's a great story. Um, Jean, you know, you worked, talking about being the president, you, you worked for a man who had once been the most important and powerful person in the world. How normal was the relationship you had? I mean, could you say no to him? Even though he was still no longer president, he, had the, he was an ex-president, there are so few of them. Um, could you say no or could you handle things? And I'm thinking of Mrs. Bush's 75th birthday party. <laughs> potential. Uh, I could say no. He. You know, he, uh, over the years, I just became more and more comfortable with him. And oh my gosh, Val, we talked about absolutely everything. We talked about everything. And, and he just, yes, he was a former president, but he was so down to earth. And of course, he was so much fun. One of the biggest fights we ever had was over Mrs. Bush's 75th birthday party. It was going to be a surprise party at the River Club. Her birthday is June 8th. And because it was a big surprise party, she could not be involved in the invitation list. So he drafted the first copy of the invitation list and it's all his friends and former staff. Now, for the most part, their friends were the same, but not always. She had some really close girlfriends back in Houston in particular, uh, whose husbands had died. And of course there was her East Wing staff uh, who she was very close to. And I'm looking at his invitation list and it's some people that she barely knew, some of his golfing buddies. But the biggest problem was there were a lot of his West Wing staff on there. And I said to him, of course, the River Club, as you know, isn't all that big. And once again, it, when you're dealing with a family as big as the Bush family, the number of people you could invite that wasn't family was very limited. And I said, sir, you've got to invite the swing staff. We got to take off your White House staff and invite her staff. And he completely disagreed with me. He said, well, why? She said, Gene, I think Barr is very close to Marlon Fitzwater. I said, I know she loves Marlon Fitzwater, but her press secretary was Anna Perez. Her chief of staff was Susan Porter Rose. He, and I said, we have to invite her. Of course, I was in the East Wing. I was one of her staff members. There were only like 15 of us. And, I, and we, had a, we had such a big fight, Val. I left. I left the office and went home. And Mrs. Bush, I was just really, because he was, he was not going to budge. And Mrs. Bush's aide, uh, her name was Kara, Kara Sanders. Then Kara Babers came and pounded on the door of the house where I was staying. And he said, oh, my gosh, you've got to come back to the office. He just can't believe that you went home and that he made you just got to come back and talk to him. So you know what? We worked it out. It all worked out. We invited the East Wing and, and it all worked out. But he was, you know, that was probably the, that was probably one of the biggest times I ever pushed back really hard on him. For you. Well, he was quite an entertainer. I think he probably gave Pearl Mesta a run for his money, her money. Um, there were so many foreign leaders that came here to Kenny Bunkport, but I think the one that fascinates me the most is when Vladimir Putin came. Can oh, you wait, you said Kenny Bunkport. Sorry. <laughs> Here's a photo of. Uh, no, are Bush. the people, are our audience seeing the photos? I don't see them, but can our audience see them? Yes, it's a picture of um, George Bush. As long as they can see him. I want to yeah, make sure they can see him. Okay, good. And Vladimir, and I'm not, and it looks like a couple of Russian security guys. I don't think I would mess with them. But what was that like, Gene? 
Um, um, so I decided the best way to tell this story is, is literally to read from the book. Um, so first of all, he, Vladimir Putin came to Walker's Point. Oh, unfortunately, I, we, we have a note that they our, our audience is not seeing the photos. Maybe we can show them all at the end. Yeah, I think that would that would be good. We're we're actually I'm discovering from our wonderful librarian <coughs> here who, that um, the selectmen <laughs> need the audio feed. I guess. Um, would you like to explain? Yes. So I'm really sorry, but we are going to have to wrap this up. Um, I am so embarrassed. Um, <laughs> They they uh, the they they changed their meeting to tonight, so we are using their feed, and um, they usually meet on Thursday nights. They changed it to tonight, so um, they're gonna cut us off in like a minute. And oh um, no, we're wondering, can we reschedule with you? Oh my gosh, this is the funniest thing that's happened in any of my book events. This Not is funny. so Kennebunkport. This, this is so Maine. I feel like I'm home. Eight. 